As the first phase of COVID-19 vaccines slowly roll out to those at highest risk, optimism builds for a path forward beyond the pandemic. But as we move into this critical period of transition, the number of new infections continues to surge, and many experts warn we have a dark winter to go through before reaching the light at the end of the pandemic. Good evening and welcome to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. We know that you have questions about COVID-19 that are unique to rural America. And tonight you can get answers straight from the experts. 877-731-6733 is the number to call. Any question you have about the virus, you can join our conversation and get an answer. 877-731-6733. We're going to go ahead and open up our phone lines right now. And joining us tonight from Omaha to take your questions, world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center, joins us. And we also welcome a very special guest tonight from Washington, D.C., Assistant Secretary for Health at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Service, four-star admiral, Dr. Brett Girwa joins us tonight as well. Dr. Gold, let's start with you. How widespread is COVID-19 in rural America tonight? You know, Christina, first of all, uh, Happy New Year to you and to uh, all of our audience, and thanks so much for uh, having us tonight. Uh, unfortunately, as you uh, opening indicated, uh, it's going to be a long and it's going to be a cold winter for the next four to six weeks ahead of us. If we start to look at some of these graphics, you can see why uh, we're already uh, at 20.6 million cases uh, across the country with averaging well over 200,000 uh, per day uh, for the last several weeks. We've just crossed recently the 350,000 uh, death mark. Uh, with death rates uh, recently of 1,300 uh, per day, but uh, recently as well as high as 3,000 per day. And we've crossed the 125,000 hospital bed occupancy rate, which is over 675,000 Americans have been hospitalized since the beginning of the pandemic. In our next graphic, you can see the map of our country, and you can see the rate of progression and growth. And while there's an awful lot of bright red uh, along some of the coastlines, particularly in Southern California, uh, parts of Texas, Oklahoma, Tennessee. You can see that it's widely spread across both the rural and urban communities. Uh, interestingly, the greater Midwest uh, was much brighter uh, a month or so ago, and over time we've seen that come down, including my home state of Nebraska. Uh, but when we start to look at the state-by-state -state data, we see that the that the uh, rural states, our farming and ranching communities, are still extremely involved. Our next graphic gives us a look at, the, uh, at a listing of some of the highest rates of spread. And as we see, Arizona, California, Tennessee, Oklahoma, Arkansas, both in rural and in urban communities, uh, particularly, for instance, in Arizona, Maricopa County, which is the uh, Phoenix, Scottsdale area, uh, tremendous amount of cases uh, per 100,000, whereas some of the Midwest is down to about 50 or 60,000, uh, 50 or 60 per uh, 100,000 uh, cases. So continuing trend changes across the United States, continuing amount of hospitalization, uh, you know, at an unprecedented rate with parts of the country that are literally running out of hospital beds, ICU beds, and healthcare professionals. You know, just to put this into some perspective, it took us eight months to get to 10 million cases in the United States. It took us 53 days to add the second 10 million. So a, a lot of darkness and a lot of cold months ahead until we can get vaccines out. And tonight we're really, really privileged uh, to have Admiral Jiwa with us, uh, who is really at the epicenter of much of this planning and response, and to use him as a source of tremendously important information, specifically focused on what rural America needs to know at this time. Absolutely. He has been a key player throughout the pandemic, just as you have, Dr. Gold. Admiral, you serve as the director of U.S. Coronavirus Diagnostic Testing, and we appreciate you joining us tonight because we know how busy you've been with Operation Warp Speed. Give us an idea of what your job entails. Well, thank you so much for having me on. Um, in my day job, I'm the Assistant Secretary for Health, uh, and my job is to be the principal public health official in the administration. 
and also I lead the Commission Corps of the Public Health Service. That's why I'm in uniform. We have 6,100 health professionals. Um, our 132nd birthday is today. Now, when coronavirus hit, we began deploying our professionals all over the uh, country and in, indeed all over the world. We were on the Diamond Princess in Japan. And what I focus on now is primarily on testing and diagnostics, and it, it's a very complex milieu. We're developing new diagnostics to make them as simple and as cheap and as accessible. Very important in rural America to have that so it's very portable and accessible. Also working on um, understanding how to link the diagnosis with different forms of treatment um, and building our whole capacity as a country. And again, I'm a pediatric ICU doctor, uh, so I do participate and work really every single day on how to best distribute and use vaccines, some of our new therapies, and of course, to stress prevention, like wearing a mask and avoiding crowded indoor spaces, which is something that everybody can do, including in rural America. And if we want to reverse those trends that Dr. Gold talked to you about just a moment ago, we all have the power to do that. We have the capability of saving tens of thousands of lives if we obey those simple mitigation strategies like wearing a mask, avoiding indoor crowded spaces, avoiding travel if you can, do all those things until the vaccine can really be widespread. We know that your ultimate mission is saving American lives, Admiral. Talk about the role that you now play in vaccine distribution. And as the month draws on, we transition to a new administration. How will it affect the rollout of vaccines? Will we see any interruption? Well, you know, um, this pathogen is brand new. This virus was never seen before on the planet. And within a year, um, as of this week, we'll have about 20 million vaccine doses distributed. This is really unprecedented. Now, that's the bright spot. The dark spot is it's gonna take a while for us to vaccinate tens of millions of individuals so we can get our population immunity up and see the results of that. But even starting today, we have senior citizens in nursing homes and our healthcare providers being vaccinated. Uh, this will start dropping the hospitalization, particularly among our uh, very uh, elderly seniors in nursing homes. So uh, good things to come. We expect another 30 million doses in January and another 50 million in February. So this is gonna rack up pretty quickly. Now, in terms of the transition, we're all health professionals. We all sort of work on the same team. We're all Americans first. Uh, I've had many positive meetings with the incoming uh, administration. Almost everyone who's working on the program today will still be working on January 21st. So I don't expect any interruption or disruption uh, in the plan. Of course, new administrations will bring new ideas. That's always welcome. We want all the new ideas we can. But I think America can pr expect a smooth and professional transition among all the doctors, public health experts that work every day just dedicated to serving Americans and saving American lives. And we're hoping by June, everybody who wants a vaccine will be able to get one. Now, Dr. Gold, can you give us an update on the vaccines that are currently available and those that may be coming down the pike soon, but still under development? Well, you know, Christina, in literally unprecedented time, two vaccines have gone from a theoretical, could we possibly do this, to a fully tested, distributed, and uh, with shots in the arm. You know, as you see, uh, uh, there are approximately uh, 43 new vaccines uh, that are in phase one and phase two. There are 20 in phase three. There are seven in uh, limited use and three uh, that are approved. And this is, of course, uh, worldwide. Now, we've heard a lot about the AstraZeneca vaccine, about the J&J &J vaccine, about the Novavax vaccine. And these are vaccines that are in phase three testing widely across the United States and around the world. Uh, but the Moderna and the Pfizer uh, vaccines are the ones that have been given uh, emergency use authorization uh, approval uh, by the Food and Drug Administration, meaning all the quality and safety metrics have been met. And those are the vaccines that are being distributed uh, across our nation. Uh, this is a map that, as, uh, you know, as of earlier this morning, that looks at some of the rollout across the United States of the nearly four and a half million individuals that have already rolled up their sleeve and been a recipient of the vaccine. Now, interestingly, in the upper Midwest, in North and South Dakota and Montana, and even in my home state of Nebraska, parts of Iowa, uh, et cetera, Colorado, 
we're starting to see a good deal uh, of rapid uptake. And I'm going to guess that over time, particularly now that we're in the post-holiday season, uh, that we're going to see more and more of this available uh, and rolled out, particularly into the long-term care facilities, into the over 75-year age groups, uh, and certainly, of course, early and first, into the frontline healthcare workers. So very exciting, a lot of light at the end of the tunnel, but as the Admiral said, we have it within our power to blunt that curve. We have it in our power to save tens of thousands, maybe even more than that, lives just by the simple things we've been talking about for the last 11 months. Uh, social distancing, wearing a face mask, use of sanitizers, avoiding gatherings, and other such things. So this is a time for us to strengthen those activities and not loosen them. This is a time for us to gird and to get ready for that wave of vaccines, which will be here all too soon. You know, we have heard some news reports stating that the vaccine rollout has been less than expected so far. We didn't expect it to be perfect. Like you said, Dr. Gold, unprecedented times. But there are a lot of critics out there. I'm wondering, Admiral, if you can give us an update on where we are and what needs to be done, in your opinion, to get to where we should be. Well, um, this is a vaccine rollout of really unprecedented scale. And as Dr. Gold said, we did this in the middle of three snowstorms and, and the holidays and starting with very specific groups. Uh, I think you will see uh, vaccine uh, rollout and uptake um, going up really exponentially in, in the very near future. Many of the long-term care facilities, they were waiting till there was enough vaccine so that CVS and Walgreens can go out and actually do the entire long-term care facility at one single time. We saw that. Many of the states are getting used to some of the procedures. For example, uh, I think it's very important that we use all assets, not just hospitals and doctor's offices, but pharmacies, very, very important. And we have over 40,000 pharmacies, including independent pharmacies that are so important in rural America to provide vaccines. They're gonna start getting into gear right after we finish this first phase. The National Guard, uh, the State Guard is being called up by many states to help. We've authorized, this is under my authority, all EMTs uh, that are in the National Guard to provide vaccination. This is very safe, this is what they do and they're trained for, but many states are just not used to that. So I think you're gonna see just a rapid uptake starting from here again. We've had about 15 and a half million doses distributed. Uh, that four and a half million, it's a number given. It's probably a little bit higher than that because there's a del delay, but certainly there's a lag there. Another four and a half million this week, and you'll just see that ramping up. So I, I am very optimistic that although we start a little bit slow and deliberate, the states are just getting accustomed to all the te uh, technology and techniques. We are going to have just a swarm of pharmacists, pharmacy technicians, healthcare workers, National Guard people distributing the vaccine. So I think you're going to see uptake really accelerating over the next few weeks. Excellent news. Our first viewer question tonight comes from social media. It's from Barbara of Tennessee. And she says, we've heard that in some rural counties, people have had to wait in line for hours for the vaccine. I'm 75 and would rather not do that. Is there another option? So I'll, I'll take well, that you and know, thank you for so that many question. Different... Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead Admiral, Dr. Gold. Please. So no, I, um, I was going to say, I, I think uh, what you two are both just polite. Admiral, take it away. <laughs> so, so thank you. And we really are concerned about that. I, I want everybody to understand that we provide just an enormous amount of guidance and the CDC works with every state and local county health department. But the counties are still trying to figure this out the best way. We see many places have like online apps where you can schedule it. Some places have started out with just first come, first serve. I think they're going to moderate that and go away from that pretty quickly. Again, it's only been about 22 days since the first vaccine has been in a single person's arm. So this is really up to the state and local and county health departments. We literally have a 24-7 support line to support those efforts. And, and I think you're gonna see that change over the uh, near future, particularly as pharmacies get involved. Um, I know my mom, she's 86 years old. She gets a call from her Walgreens to tell her exactly when to come in to get her shot for influenza and they're already warming her up for her COVID shot. So I think you're gonna see that evolve over the next short period of time. And let me get it over to Dr. Gold now. 
I'm just going to echo what you said, sir. Uh, I think the first come, first serve, particularly for the over 75 and the people with multiple comorbidities, uh, is just too complex and, and too confusing. Our, our approach here has really been to go out to the long-term care facilities and to uh, immunize these people in their sites. And as far as the frontline health care workers, which we've been very successful in immunizing, they've been all done by appointment in cohorts. And so that allows us to maintain social distancing uh, during the entire process and, frankly, uh, get people in and out in a matter of minutes. Uh, you know, we, of course, follow the 15 minutes of observation uh, after each immunization. But short of that, people come in, they uh, fill out the necessary paperwork. It's all computerized. Uh, they get their jab. Uh, it's pretty painless is what I've been told. Uh, then they get observed for 15 minutes and then they're back to work uh, or back home. So I, I think that's the system that we're going to be seeing more widely uh, across the country. As we do start to see more of the vaccine go out and we get more available, are we going to see any sort of a difference in the way that it's distributed? Or are we still going to be going through CVS, Walgreens and your doctor's office? So um, the way this works is the states get uh, allocated vaccines uh, and, and literally on a Tuesday, we know what's going to be available the following week. Uh, we let the states know. Um, it's all done on a per capita basis, so it goes to states according to their uh, population over 18 years of age. There are special distributions to the Indian Health Service because the tribes, particularly in rural America, have very specific needs, so we're not going to focus on them right here. But on Tuesday, that number goes out. On Thursday, the states provide an order. Where do they want it shipped? Uh, many states, uh, in fact, a majority of states are going to be using um, all the pharmacy chains. I think we have 19 different pharmacy chains enrolled, uh, which is 60 percent of all pharmacies in the United States. Some states want to go to some central locations by the public health department. Obviously, some go to central hospital areas. So it's really a state by state thing. And I think that's really important, particularly in rural America, because what works in New York City is not going to work in South Dakota or Mont Montana or even parts of Texas where I'm from, where you still have many, many counties, you know, that don't have a physician. So it's going to really be on a case by case basis. But wherever that state says they want it, we ship it. They get it on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then we start the process over again. OK, we know how busy you are. And I just want to ask you one more question, if I might. It's a big one. Sure. You, you reinforced on a number of occasions that we'll see fair and equitable distribution of vaccines because it's about public health and you'll never let politics enter into that. But that sentiment speaks volumes about an additional layer of complexity that you've had to deal with this year with the pandemic. How challenging has it been for you to convey your clear message about public safety to the masses and what do you think we as a country can do better if we ever find ourselves in a situation like this again? Well, you know, thank you for that question. I think it's a fair question. Um, it, it's been very difficult, I think, to convey messages uh, this year because it's been such a politically charged atmosphere, particularly in Washington. Um, and you may speak for 20 minutes on an interview but that 30 second piece that you might be at odds with someone in the administration or you might be looked at as being contrary to the president or the task force, that's sort of what's jumped on by the media and amplified. So, um, you know, we, we try to be very, very careful. I am always and everybody I know here is, is as honest as possible. I mean, we are brutally honest with the American people. We're trying to convey the best information. But, you know, sometimes sometimes things get um, you know, emphasized in the media. This is a live broadcast. You're not editing what I say. So what I say, the American people hear, that's not always the way it is. So that's really been a challenge. And I think um, Americans in general, I would say one big, uh, there are a couple of big uh, lessons, many lessons from this pandemic. Um, number one is that public health is critically important. And I know Dr. Gold will agree with this. And you can't sort of intermittently invest in public health. We've got to keep our rural hospitals strong, uh, our safety net hospitals strong. We've got to keep the public health workforce. We've got to invest in our uh, land grant uh, universities to train people in public health and nursing and uh, EMTs and the whole gamut. We can't just do that when a pandemic hits. 
Secondly, and I, I see this every day in testing, and it's certainly been important in PPE and even vaccines, is we got to think about made in America really seriously. You can't be in a pandemic. You know, I'm flying C-17s and 747s from around the world just trying to get simple supplies um, and really negotiating for them and working through the State Department. We really have to be not completely self-sufficient. We, we're not going to be isolationists. But we have to do more in America to make sure that we can supply all the critical needs for all our workers. So, um, you know, I think preparation is an ongoing habit. It's a way of life, and we need to be involved in that and support uh, people like Dr. Gold and, and his university, which has really been a leader in the public health space and particularly the infectious disease space for like two decades. Um, they've really led the charge, and we've relied on them, and thank you for all your work, and I want to thank Americans for all you do. And remember, um, you have the power to save tens of thousands of lives. Uh, do like Dr. Gold and I said, wear a mask if you can't physically distance, try to avoid crowded indoor spaces, wash your hands, and we will get through this together as a country. Thank you. Grateful to share this country with you. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We have much more to come. Stay with us. More Rural Health Matters with the University of Nebraska Medical Center right after this. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us once again is world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And we also welcome Nebraska Commissioner of Education tonight, Dr. Matt Bloomstead. We have an all-star lineup tonight. Before we go to Dr. Bloomstead, we have an important question coming your way about second semester and what we've learned from sending kids back to school. But we want to make sure we get to our viewers. Karen of Florida is up next. Let's listen. Hi there. Thanks so much for your show. I watch it every week. My question is, when a person has COVID, when is the best time for he or she to go and get tested for antibodies after having COVID. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Well, Karen, we believe that the antibody levels after you've infected and been tested positive for COVID will peak sometime in the first uh, 30 days. And then over the next 60 to 90 days, we'll continue to fall down to a baseline level. So if you need antibody testing, and it's not even clear right now what antibody testing uh, is useful for other than just to confirm that somebody did mount an immune response and how long it lasts. It's used all the time for research purposes, but much less for clinical purposes. But if that's going to be the rule and you're going to do it, then I would say uh, between uh, 20 and 40 days uh, after your infection, would be a time to get your blood drawn and, uh, and get your antibody levels confirmed. All right, thank you for that question, Karen. James from Ohio is next, go right ahead. Uh, yeah, I would like to know, we had the COVID back in early in, uh, November, and we're trying to figure out if you want to have it and get over it, can you get it again? Well, James, uh, there's very little evidence uh, that, a, that it's highly transmissible a second time. There are a small number of individuals that have been confirmed to have been reinfected a second time. It is unclear whether they completely uh, eliminated the virus after their first infection and just carried it for a longer period of time, or whether they were actually infected with a different strain of the virus. Now, have you probably seen in the media uh, there's been an awful lot written about this new strain from southeast uh, portion of Great Britain from the United Kingdom and a lot being written about the South African strain, which are truly different strains of the virus with significant genetic mutations uh, that have now been documented. We believe that, uh, that there's still good immune uh, competence of individuals uh, for these two strains, and that is very unlikely that people get reinfected a second time with one of these two strains, but only time will tell the answer to that question. So uh, right now, the uh, CDC and the Food and Drug Administration are both recommending that individuals that have been previously infected should go ahead and get immunized uh, when the vaccine becomes available, because uh, even if you have antibodies, that will just top off the strength of your antibody response. Probably want to wait several weeks to a month 
and probably want to talk to your local health care professional. But I would say that if, uh, if you were ill in November, uh, when the vaccine becomes available to you, you probably should take it. All right. Thank you so much for that call. Now we want to bring Dr. Bloomstead into the conversation. We love having you on. You have such a beautiful spirit. <laughs> you can just tell. I'm sure the kids are very fond of you. So many of us were concerned about kids returning to the classroom in the fall and the potential of students triggering super spreader events. But what have you actually observed? Yeah, really what we've seen in Nebraska anyway, and, and really has been seen across the country from at least from different anecdotes and even studies that have been done around transmission within schools is if you follow the procedures, everything that, that we hear over and over again, mask wearing, social distancing, uh, making sure that schools are able to de-densify, meaning uh, have, small, have fewer kids in, in larger spaces if possible, uh, we're really not seeing uh, much uh, spread or much concern about, about the overall spread within schools. But human nature kicks in and uh, people can let their guard down very quickly. And we've seen that uh, generally be the bigger concern within schools is when perhaps teachers that have been very stressed, working very, very hard, um, end up gathering together perhaps for a meal, even in a teacher's lounge or otherwise. And that those are the places where we actually end up seeing that, the type of spread that, that's really uh, a challenge for us. And, and then again, just people's personal lives, uh, understanding that uh, the same things that keep it from spreading within a school are also the same things that can help us keep it from spreading in, in society generally. You know, so what are the kids doing that the rest of us can learn from? Yeah, I, I think actually kids, I mean, we, we had a lot of concern in Nebraska and certainly across the country, I'm sure that kids wouldn't be able to adapt to mask wearing and the social distancing, but but our children uh, really uh, are designed to learn. They they really understand how to be safe. Um, I think we've seen that in the in the past with uh, other safety measures that, that take place. I know I've talked about it on this show before, whether smoke detectors or uh, car seats, uh, our students are really sponges for that type of knowledge and they implement it. They implement it well. Um, kids as, as young as three years old uh, actually uh, um, that I personally know are able to wear and maintain masks and eyeglasses and other things um, as well as just our students really become models for us as adults and and the things that we fear are not necessarily the things that are going to be uh, as problematic within schools. Our, our students and our teachers and really just the models that, that you can find within, within the school setting are the right things to doing and kids are replicating that when they go to their to their families when they even I'm, I'm hopeful anyway uh, at family gatherings across uh, Nebraska and across the country that that uh, you know children were talking to their families about what was safe in school and why it was safe I've got a nephew and uh, he'll always point out if my sister was not wearing her mask. No, she wasn't. He always wants to be the first to let me know. So kids, you've got to be accountable to them. I love that. Dr. Bloomstead also. <laughs> my kids hold me accountable all the time. They hey, hold good. me accountable constantly. Good so. for them. Yeah. I love that. Now, as we move into the second sem semester, we've gone into almost a full year of pandemic style learning. Do you think that there are aspects of education that have changed for good? Yeah, there definitely are. I mean, we've learned a lot in uh, the challenges that our teachers have, have faced within classrooms. Of course, they're worried about everything from cleaning uh, the surfaces on a regular basis, uh, constantly being aware there. But we've seen uh, teachers have to provide educational opportunities, uh, both for students that are right there in their classroom, as well as um, perhaps uh, taking courses online um, and, and, and participating in the classroom from a video conferencing perspective. And so um, finding our balance on that is really important. I, I kind of gave a halftime speech in Nebraska about where we can make some improvements, uh, you know, as we completed the first uh, the first semester, and now we're just starting the second semester. I, I want to make sure that we're relieving uh, leaving time for uh, both students and, and and teachers to have a break from the environments that are maybe more stressful for them. And it's really important that we are constantly aware of the stresses that that teachers and families may be having in these times 
times. Um, I think where we got really uh, saw some improvements in education is just uh, the constant awareness of uh, mental health, the constant awareness of of the uh, you know thinking holistically about about our students and their needs is is really important. We're going to see more of that coming out of this pandemic. Uh, there's really going to be a, a, an ongoing need to uh, address academic recovery after the the effects of the pandemic pandemic are ultimately gone. So we have a lot of work yet to do, but what I'm inspired by, and I think what we've seen in education is that kind of left to our devices to, to think through and strategize, we come up with the best solutions at the most local levels. And I think that's inspiring. Absolutely it is. All right, we're gonna go back to the phones. Matt from Alabama is our next caller. Matt, go right ahead. Yes, my question would be for each state, it seems to be doing it differently as far as the bar on the elderly. Uh, I'm in my 70s, and recently they, they've announced that school teachers will be next in line for the vaccine. They've done the um, nursing homes and the EMTs and the nurse uh, first responders, which is absolutely necessary. I don't understand, though, why they seem to be jumping over the uh, seniors and going to different uh, levels of this thing. And I've also seen right on RF&D where the Meat Packers uh, Union is pushing to get, and lobbyists is pushing to get uh, them, those folks in line first. So question would be, uh, where are the seniors and how we stand with this thing uh, if you're under 75 and over 65? Now, well, the uh, over 75-year-old age group <clears throat> and essential workers, which can be everything from truck drivers to, uh, you know, grocery store workers to uh, package delivery, uh, et cetera, uh, are in what we call the uh, 1B category. You know, the, the 1As uh, are the frontline health care workers uh, and the long-term care residents uh, and their staff. Uh, the 1Bs are those that are over 75. And the 1Cs are the 65 to 75-year-old age group. However, I will tell you, that as time goes on, these different categories are going to become increasingly blurred. And what I mean by that is that you're not going to have to finish one category completely before you start rolling out the red carpet uh, for the other categories. So I would imagine as some of the essential health care workers, uh, the long-term care facilities, uh, and, the, uh, and the really frontline essential workers, the paramedics, the firefighters, law enforcement, et cetera, uh, get their vaccines, uh, it's, as supply allows, it's going to allow for a much broader uh, distribution. So to put this into a little bit of numerical perspective, which might be interesting uh, tonight, is there are about uh, 21 million people that fall into the category of frontline health care workers uh, in the United States, about 3 million uh, long-term care, uh, uh, both staff and residents, and then somewhere just north of 50 million uh, that are in this category of over 75 and are considered essential uh, from some of the things that they do. So if you uh, add all that up, you're talking about very close to 75 million doses. And the vaccines we're talking about, of course, the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine, require two doses three or four weeks apart, depending on which one you get. So that means we're talking about the first 150 million doses of vaccine distributed in the United States. So that's going to take us a good number of weeks to, I'm going to guess, four to six weeks uh, to get that whole category done before we start to work into the uh, phase uh, uh, 1C and phase 2A and other phases. Uh, will exceptions be made? All the time. And, and this is fluid as well. When we meet back here next Monday, you might have new information as to who's included in the next phase as well. So this is something that we're going to stay on top of every single week right here on Rural Health Matters to bring you the latest. Our next question comes from California. John joins the conversation. Thanks for joining us, John. Go right ahead. Yeah, um, I saw on television where they listed the ingredients of the vaccines. They had four vaccines and they listed the ingredients of them. And one of the ingredients was DNA. And I wonder where, where does the DNA come from? It's made, uh, John. So uh, this is DNA specifically to be transcribed by your cells, to be converted by your cells uh, into a very unique protein, which is called the spike protein. 
And this is maybe worth one of our graphics to uh, talk about how these vaccines work because uh, there are a lot of questions. And so what basically happens is either a strand of messenger RNA, ribonucleic virus, or deoxyribonucleic virus, uh, DNA, uh, is injected. Uh, it's carried into your cells and through the muscle tissue. And then it causes your cells to manufacture this very unique type of protein that sits on the surface of these uh, COVID-causing uh, uh, viruses uh, called the spike protein. You, know, you may remember all the artist's renderings of the spike proteins show these little spikes, these little halos uh, extending from the surface. That's the surface that the antibodies that you manufacture glom onto and prevent the spread and, and ultimately kill the virus. And so what happens to the DNA is it's taken up into your cells, it is transcribed and synthesized into protein that looks just like the spike protein. It's not a virus. It doesn't become part of your DNA permanently, but it's there long enough to manufacture the spike protein, which then your antibodies glom onto and prevent you from uh, getting it. So then when your body sees the real COVID-causing virus, SARS-CoV-2, as it's caused, uh, you already have the antibodies shown here in red ready to rip out the, the guts and to make sure that those viruses never cause a clinical infection for you. Uh, and that's how these messenger RNA, uh, the attenuated virus uh, materials, and the DNA uh, vaccines work. You know, I think one of the reasons why there's so much skepticism surrounding DNA is it's for the first time a lot of people are hearing about this, but this has actually been used in gene therapy for cancer treatment. Isn't that right, Dr. Gold? Well, for a very long time, and indeed uh, in our research laboratories and in our clinics uh, here at the Buffett Cancer Center, we've been doing a lot of this uh, genetic uh, treatment of cancer, which has been almost uh, unprecedented in the number of cures that you can get from leukemia and lymphoma, and ultimately are going to be accelerated into many other different types of cancers as well. It's known as what's called CAR-T therapy. But this is a way of converting your own cells, your own white cells, uh, into killer white cells, killer T cells, that will wipe out cancer. In this case, we're using the genetics from the virus itself to get you to mount a response. <clears throat> very similar, not identical, but very similar concept in mobilizing your own cells to provide the protection and to protect you from getting this infection. Fascinating. Okay, we're gonna go to New York to speak with Bruce next. Thanks for joining the conversation. Bruce, go right ahead. Uh, probably this refers to uh, Dr. Gull. Is all the uh, antibiotics or hand washes and all that on uh, You know what? You might have your television on, and that might be creating a little interference. Do you want to try again okay, for us? Okay, maybe. I'm, I'm, no, I'm going to go right now. Uh, all the, the hand sanitizers and stuff that's on the market and on the shelves, turn the television down. Yeah, shut the thing down. <laughs> it's live right television. Down. happens. Yeah. Okay. You, you still with me? Yep. Yeah. Okay. I know all the hand stuff that you see in the stores and in the shelf and even in our house and every place you go, are they all the same uh, uh, source of, uh, uh, of of a cleaner? All the same or are yeah. they different, so, different uh, manufacturers mm -hmm. or is Clorox still a good bet? So the... Uh the, the best judge is the percent alcohol in the cleanser that you're selecting. And there's all clearly written on the label. Some say they're double strength, triple strength, etc. cetera. Uh, but those that are being sold as uh, approved sanitizers uh, all have a seal on them uh, that, uh, you know, that, that allows you to know that they're going to be effective. And they can be uh, a pure liquid, they can be a gel, they can be a semi-solid, uh, you know, and it doesn't make any difference uh, who the manufacturer is. 
as long as they have an approved amount of uh, alcohol uh, content. Now, the, the ones that are gelled are usually mixed with a, an aloe-like compound just to make them a little easier on your hands. You know, as a recovering cardiac surgeon, you spend the whole day in the operating room scrubbing my hands, you know, very often. Uh, that will have an effect on your skin of, of both drying and chaping and things of that nature. And so the sanitizers that have the gel compound in it are just gelled in a way that it allows you uh, to rub it into your skin and condition your skin a little bit at the same time you're wiping out the virus. All right. Thank you for that call, Bruce of New York. And that leaves a line open for you tonight. More Rural Health Matters with the University of Nebraska Medical Center right after this. The number to call is 877-731-6733. We'll be right back after this quick break. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us once again, world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And we also welcome Nebraska Commissioner of Education, Dr. Matt Bloomstead. We were talking about how students have been impacted from the pandemic, and many parents and students have said they don't feel as though they're getting the full educational experience that they normally would have if they were able to go into the classroom over the past 300 65 days, as we normally saw. Do you have any advice for parents or caregivers if their child is not getting that specialized service that they need because of the pandemic? And how long do you think it will be before we can see students returning to the classroom on a regular basis? Yeah, and we, we've certainly been, I guess, fortunate in Nebraska that we've really had the vast majority of our students in the classrooms and learning, but we certainly have a, a percentage of, of students who, by parent choice or otherwise, have chosen uh, to be uh, remote, or in some cases that that they uh, may have medical issues or other things that, that are causing types of concern. So really our advice to uh, parents and to, and to students and to everyone is to kind of keep talking with one another. Keep really working together to understand what you think are the challenges that you might be uh, still facing and the, the types of things that maybe you feel like you lost. We, we're you know just in the midst of this, still trying to measure what types of learning loss, what types of opportunity loss was uh, you know presented. We're very concerned about our students with special needs uh, in, in particular. I think right now and and uh, you know I've, I've recently started talking with our team and certainly across the nation with with folks, uh, with my colleagues across the nation as they look at how they're going to address learning loss for, for students. And so, number one, first you have to kind of know what the, those challenges are. And so part of that communication between parents and the schools is to to make sure that we understand, you know, number one, what the, what the students have faced, you know, what the challenges have been. You know, again, because where we've seen students in person so much in, in Nebraska itself, uh, I think we're at least hopeful that, that we'll be able to to address some of those losses, but I'm concerned for places that have been out of school since last March, and and we know that we're going to have to be able to, um, you know, dedicate resources. We see that there's federal funds that are coming to uh, help address some of the academic needs of our of our students and our families, and and taking that opportunity and really building as individualized uh, uh, opportunities as possible for students coming out of this. So um, again, I, I don't want parents to be afraid of uh, assessments. Sometimes they get afraid of whether they're just local assessments, understanding what those needs are. We're really trying to make sure that the assessments are done for the benefit of students and that we're really knowing where students are at, meeting them there and helping them, uh, you know, create a new trajectory of, of how they can get both to uh, the success that they want and meet the goals that they have. Absolutely. Dr. Gold, have we learned anything new about how the virus is transmitted by children who are asymptomatic in particular? You know, I, it's a very interesting question, uh, Christina, because the literature, the very preliminary literature on some of these mutant variants of the virus, both the UK virus and the virus from South Africa, which are significantly different uh, strains of the virus, seem to be more easily transmitted by children. Uh, and uh, we know that children can be asymptomatic, they can be carriers, they can spread the uh, disease uh, without even knowing uh, that they've been infected. 
but the, these new strains seem to be somewhat more uh, heavily impacting uh, young adults uh, and children. You know, just to follow up on what Dr. Bloomstead said a minute ago, you know, if we look across the university system here, uh, we've had, you know, uh, at, here at the University of Nebraska at Omaha, just to put a few numbers on this, just to give you some reference, we have about 16,000 students and about 5,000 faculty and staff. That would be 20,000 people. In the entirety of the fall semester, we had just over 500 confirmed cases of COVID. Interestingly, uh, all but about 10%, maybe less than that, uh, were uh, acquired off campus, meaning uh, in the community. Uh, and of those that were acquired on campus, almost all of them were acquired in a residence hall uh, or in a dining facility and not in a classroom environment. So whether it's a combination of social distancing, mask wearing, etc., cetera, uh, we know in the educational environment now much better than we did six months ago or 12 months ago how to present, prevent the transmission of the virus. And I think that this is going to be really important as we get back into the spring semester now. We have much more robust availability of testing. We've got better antiviral drugs. And of course, as we've been discussing earlier, uh, we have vaccines that are just around the corner as well. So uh, a lot to be optimistic about, but also we need to continue to take extra special care. Absolutely, especially right now, based on the numbers that you presented to us at the beginning of the show, Dr. Gold. Next up is Annabelle from Wyoming. Thanks for joining the conversation, Annabelle. Go right ahead. Yes, my question is that regarding what has been shown on the news lately, that pigs can catch this uh, COVID-19, and I'm wondering if there's apt to be transmission to humans in that, and uh, if uh, antibodies that these uh, animals produce might be of help in vaccines. I guess those are my two, two parts of my question. They're both great questions, Annabelle. <clears throat> so the, uh, other than the original uh, bat transmission in Wuhan City uh, in China, uh, and whether or not the pangolin, uh, you know, fresh market was involved in this, uh, and in, believe it or not, in mink, uh, there's really not been a lot about animal to human uh, transmission. We do know, for instance, that dogs and cats uh, can get COVID. I'm sure that pigs can get COVID there. These coronaviruses are widely circulated uh, in the animal kingdoms uh, in our nation. But the ability to back uh, transmit the virus to human beings would take a significant genetic shift. And that was one of the concerns about what happened in Denmark uh, with the mink and what's actually been identified now in, uh, in the United States in both domestic uh, and in wild mink populations. So it's something that we're going to have to monitor very carefully. Now, having said that, uh, the ability to cause uh, animals, particularly larger animals such as cattle, uh, to produce human antibodies is actively ongoing uh, research across the country. And there are several new monoclonal antibody drugs that have been developed in live animals, in cattle, with so-called humanized genetic systems that are specifically being cultivated uh, to treat COVID in, in large quantities. This technology has been used in uh, phase one and phase two testing uh, to treat both MERS and SARS uh, in the Middle East and, and in the Far East, which of course are also uh, uh, coronavirus infections. Uh, there have been research done in using uh, monoclonal antibodies and polyclonal antibodies raised in cattle uh, to treat Ebola virus disease uh, in Africa, which of course was such a problem several years ago. And so uh, this is a very interesting and a very important uh, pharmacologic tool that we continue to have available to us. Now we just need to contrast that uh, to the Eli Lilly and the Regeneron products, which are monoclonal antibodies, which are chemically synthesized. So these are not raised in large animals uh, that are immunized, uh, but these are products that are chemically synthesized and then packaged uh, to treat uh, individuals in the early stages of uh, COVID virus disease. 
You never cease to amaze us with your breadth of knowledge, Dr. Cole. Thank you so much for that call. We sure appreciate it, Annabelle. D from California is next. Thanks for joining the conversation, D. Go right ahead. <sighs> Sounds like we get a little music before D. Okay. D might be on hold. We're going to go ahead and move on to Sarah is our next caller from Nebraska. Go right ahead. Hey there. An earlier caller had asked about the ingredients and the doctor had mentioned that the DNA was made. And I'm curious, how do you make DNA? Sure. Well, <clears throat> there are base pairs uh, of the... Uh, of the individual acids that go into the DNA, and then there are enzymes uh, that actually will synthesize the, the DNA, the fragments, uh, into chains of DNA, uh, which will then be transferred uh, from DNA into RNA and RNA uh, into protein uh, complexes. So uh, <clears throat> uh, we, while our bodies uh, don't do that uh, routinely, other than, for instance, in our blood cells, where we manufacture that uh, all the time, uh, we through processes of replication, uh, there are ways through, as I say, to both synthesize and to degrade uh, DNA and RNA uh, through uh, various both naturally occurring and synthetic enzymes. And, uh, and, that's, uh, and that's the state of the art of not just the uh, antivirals we're talking about and the vaccines, but also of the cancer treatments, Sarah, as well. Just fascinating. All right, Dr. Bloom said, I want to bring you in the conversation because we've had a lot of good news in our schools. We know that teachers would do anything for their students. Many aren't in the job for the paycheck itself. But we've also seen some heartbreaking stories about beloved teachers who have died of COVID-19. Talk about the morale in the education system right now and what we can do to help our teachers and even our students out there as Americans right now as a community. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that, number one, just the recognition of teachers and what they do all the time, and even in non-pandemic times, I mean, it's really very remarkable uh, what they did. I, I think when when so many students were sent to their their homes to do remote learning, and, and I think parents overall uh, would probably, me included even, would say that, um, you know, the day-to-day the -day challenges that teachers face in keeping students engaged in a meaningful way is just absolutely remarkable and so I think that's why there's so much uh, desire to have students in person and and I think what we know is that you really can't re replace that in-person uh, uh, efforts uh, that the teachers do on, our, on a regular basis but I think the general public just needs to really be able to recognize that parents need to have patience as they as they work with their teachers but to really again just thank them continue to understand that their their job has been extremely difficult right now. We're worried, I think, that we'll see many people uh, leave the teaching profession because of how difficult this has been. And, and uh, you know, everything that everyone does, just, just to try to support and partner with, with teachers to be part of the solution that we need right now is, is really important. And I, I, I know there's it's just thanking people uh, for what they're doing on a daily basis is just part of the story. Uh, my mom's a teacher. She would come home so tired, but what she got back from the students was well worth her while. I know that. God bless our teachers out there. Dr. Gold, do you have final thoughts for our viewers tonight? Yeah, just to say that this is a time to uh, redouble our efforts, to be sure that we uh, use our mask, uh, hand sanitizer, social distancing, uh, and when the opportunity to get that vaccine comes around, <clears throat> please roll up your sleeve. It's critically important. That is the best way we're going to control the spread of this virus. And like we talked about earlier, we will be here for you every Monday night to continually bring you updates on the latest vaccine developments, the rollout process. And we want to thank you for joining us tonight. UNMC Chancellor Dr. Jeffrey Gold and Nebraska Commissioner of Education Dr. Matt Bloomstead. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you right here on Monday night. Wishing you and your family a beautifully blessed evening.